This presentation is part three of a three-part series on VFR operations and cross-country planning. In this lesson, we will look at some of the specifics of conducting a VFR cross-country leg. The example cross-country leg will be from Garden City, Kansas to Pueblo, Colorado. Planning a VFR flight is not much different than planning an IFR one. The biggest difference is planning a route that keeps you in VMC the entire time and avoids special use airspace. Depending on your training objectives, Plan the route using either ground references or by use of VOR navigation. When planning a VFR flight, it is usually best to start big picture, then work out the details once you're confident the flight can be completed given the en route and terminal weather conditions. There are many variables to consider when choosing your cruise altitude, such as total en route distance, weather, terrain, winds aloft, and fuel burn. First off, the maximum altitude you may fly VFR is 18,000 feet MSL. Additionally, AFI 11-2T6 Vol 3 states the minimum altitude for VFR non-local point-to-point navigation missions dictated by operational training requirements is 3,000 feet AGL. AFI 11-202 Vol 3 contains a catch-all that states except for MAGCOM approved aerial demonstrations or during takeoff and landing, do not operate aircraft below an altitude that, should an emergency landing become necessary, creates undue hazard to persons or property. When above 3,000 feet AGL, VFR cruise altitudes should be flown at even or odd thousands plus 500 feet, depending on your direction of travel. While not mandatory, these VFR hemispheric altitudes help prevent mid-air collisions between VFR and IFR traffic, and eastbound and westbound traffic. When using ForeFlight for mission planning, connect to Wi-Fi for current NOTAMs and weather. After inputting your route on the Maps tab, you can select your cruise altitude, circled in yellow, to see how winds will impact your en route time and fuel burn. Now we will look at how to plan a VFR cross-country flight from Garden City, Kansas to Pueblo, Colorado. As a rule of thumb, 10% of total distance is a good starting point for picking your cruise altitude. In this case, the cruise altitude would be 18,000 feet MSL, since the total distance is 180 miles. If flying IFR and weather and winds were favorable at 18,000 feet, that would be a suitable cruise altitude for this flight. VFR traffic typically flies much lower than 18,000 feet, however, especially if using pilotage as the primary means of navigation. When using pilotage, it is best to fly closer to 3,000 feet AGL to assist with visual identification of landmarks. With that in mind, Garden City has a field elevation of approximately 2,900 feet and Pueblo is approximately 4,700 feet. There is no significant terrain to cross between Garden City and Pueblo. After departing Garden City, an initial altitude of 6,500 feet MSL would be just over 3,000 feet AGL. If you maintain 6,500 feet all the way to Pueblo, the rising terrain would eventually make you only about 2,000 feet AGL nearing Pueblo, so at some point you'll probably want to climb to a higher VFR altitude, ideally no higher than 16,500 feet. On the topic of altitudes, each quadrant on sectional charts includes a maximum elevation figure, seen here circled in orange. The max elevation figure indicates the height of the highest feature within the quadrant, rounded up to the nearest 100, plus 100 feet. As discussed in part two, pilotage and dead reckoning simply means navigating visually point to point and backing yourself up with calculated checkpoint times. For flight mission planning and execution has made flight planning fast and accurate. Back in the day, Air Force student pilots filled out paper nav logs like the one on the right. Each sortie, students would plot their course, measure distances, figure out ground speeds. Those were dark times in aviation. Nowadays, ForeFlight quickly generates nav logs with very little effort on your part. Once your route is complete, click the box circled in yellow and click Flights. Now select your flight, circled in yellow, and click nav log, circled in red. Boom, nav log complete. In your performance section of the abbreviated checklist, page P15, is the clean configuration, no wind, long range cruise data. Since ForeFlight predicted you'd be flying 258 knots true airspeed at 10,500 feet, you can expect this performance if you set the PCL to a fuel flow of 490 pounds per hour. 
As seen in the chart, this equates to 211 knots indicated. You can also expect a ground speed of 265 knots. Of course, winds aloft may vary from plan since they are measured every 12 hours by weather balloons. Here, we are getting a better than predicted ground and indicated airspeed at 490 pounds per hour fuel flow. If you're curious what your actual true airspeed is while airborne, use the GPS Calc 2 and Calc 3 pages. On Calc page 2, manually input your indicated airspeed as your calibrated airspeed because, hey, close enough. I mean, if we were going to debate a couple knots difference, instead let's talk about how every other plane in existence less than 20 years old displays true airspeed automatically. I digress. Next, input your cruise altitude, altimeter setting, and outside air temperature, not your indicated OAT. To find your actual outside air temperature, refer to page P8 of your performance section of the abbreviated checklist. Here, the indicated OAT is 10 degrees Celsius, and at 10,000 feet, your approximate actual OAT is negative 5 degrees Celsius. True airspeed is now displayed at the bottom of Calc 2. If you go to Calc 3, you will see true airspeed and winds aloft. How easy was that? Navigating VOR to VOR and on Victor Airways is a common way to navigate while VFR or IFR. Keep in mind when operating on Victor Airways in excess of 180 knots, you should be flying IFR per the 11202 Vol 3, which was covered in part one of this series. When using the GPS for cross-country flights, check the flight plan for accuracy as seen on the GPS here. To get to this display, rotate each large knob one click counterclockwise. Ensure the waypoints are in order and the total distance matches the planned distance. Here you see Victor 10, circled in blue, connects the Garden City and Lamar VORs. The total distance between the two VORs is 94 nautical miles. To fly this Victor Airway, have the Garden City VOR frequency, 113.3, circled in green, set as the primary frequency in the RMU. Also have 270 set in the HSI course select window. At the halfway mark, 47 nautical miles from the Garden City VOR, set the Lamar frequency, 116.9, circled in red, as primary in the RMU and set 268, which is the reciprocal of 088, also circled in red, in the HSI course select window. As discussed on the last slide, the flight plan display, bottom left, is a useful display for cross-country flights because it shows each waypoint and current distance and time to each. We'll now discuss filing a VFR flight plan, which is required per the 11202 Vol 3. There are a number of ways to file a VFR flight plan, and your flight instructor can assist you with the process if you have any questions. Foreflight is one of the easiest ways to file a flight plan. Calling a flight service station briefer at 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF or filing online at 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF.COM is another option. Your in-flight guide contains login and filing information for filing online. On a military base, filing a Form 175 with base ops is yet another option. If filing a Form 175, consult Chapter 4 of the GP located in the planning documents of Foreflight. Once you've checked weather, NOTAMs, filed your flight plan, figured out your taxi plan at the departure and destination airports, and calculated your toll, you're basically ready to fly the sortie. Once airborne, you should activate your flight plan, especially if not utilizing flight following. Utilizing VFR flight following and activating your flight plan is for your protection in the event you have an emergency and have to eject. Obviously, when talking with ATC en route, you can let the controller know you have a problem and will be ejecting. They will then initiate rescue services. The same is true if you are not talking with ATC and are overdue at your destination, but this is only the case if you activated your flight plan. 30 minutes after your scheduled land time, Flight Service Station will initiate search and rescue by first calling the phone number you filed on the flight plan. If no answer, they will call the control tower for where you were scheduled to land. If you are still unaccounted for after a couple hours, search and rescue agencies, such as the Civil Air Patrol, will be notified. It should go without saying you do not want search and rescue initiated if you do not actually need it, so be sure you are filing an accurate landing time, a long en route time, 
And of course, remember to close that flight plan. Activating your flight plan can be done on ForeFlight or with a flight service station. You can think of a flight service station as base ops. Flight service stations are located across the country. They can provide pilots with a wide array of services, such as weather information, NOTAMs, and flight plan filing, activation, and IFR clearance if you are on the ground at an NTA. There are two ways to contact flight service stations. The first is using a phone and calling 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF. The second is calling them on the radio pretty much the same way you contact ATC. There are multiple ways to get the frequencies of the nearest flight service stations from your location. As seen on the left, in ForeFlight, you can look up the nearest airfield on the airport tab, then select flight service. Some of the VOR nav aid boxes on sectional charts also list the nearest flight service station facility name and frequency, or frequencies, they can be reached on. When on the ground at Sioux City, or when flying near, contact the Fort Dodge Flight Service Station on 122.45 or 255.4. 255 255.4 254 is the only UHF frequency flight service stations monitor so you can use that frequency anywhere in the United States. At Sioux City, Fort Dodge Flight Service Station can also receive voice transmissions on 122.1, as denoted by the R following 122.1, but they cannot transmit on that frequency. If you are transmitting on 122.1, you need to listen to the Sioux City VOR in order to hear the Flight Service Station's reply, the same way you would identify and monitor Morse code identifiers. The same flight service station utilizes multiple frequencies, and different flight service stations utilize the same frequency. For this reason, when calling the flight service station, it is best to include the facility name and frequency you are using. The call sign for flight service stations is radio. An example radio call is Fort Dodge Radio, Evil 13, transmitting on 122.45. The controller will say go ahead. If you do not hear a reply, Climb if able for better reception, or try another frequency. To activate your flight plan while airborne on this cross-country sortie, you can call Wichita Radio on 122.45, as seen circled in red. Closing your VFR flight plan can also be done in the same fashion while airborne, or while on the ground. If you cannot reach the flight service station over the radio while on the ground, use your phone and call 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF. When landing at a tower-controlled airfield in the United States, Tower will close your IFR flight plan, but they will not close your VFR flight plan. When landing at a military airfield, base operations will close VFR flight plans. When landing at a civil airfield VFR, the pilot is responsible for ensuring that their flight plan is closed. This concludes your academic training on cross-country VFR operations. If you have questions, do not hesitate to ask an IP after consulting the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. AIM 11202 Vol 3 and 11217.